Let's grab our Bible, let's grab our notepad, grab our pen, and move into the Word today. If you love His Word, just type it in right there in those comments. Say, I love His Word. I love His Word. I want to get started, and I'm going to be moving in a different direction of thought over the next few weeks, but I felt very heavily impressed to highlight something that's very important to me and very important to the culture of All Nations South, and that is the principle of worship. Worship is something that has been heavily tested over the course of this quarantine by way of us being thrown into disarray on how we're used to doing it. We're so used to worship being a, a timeline in the service, our corporate worship, which you've got to understand as a, as a sidebar before I move into this, corporate worship can still happen in virtual spaces. There is a gathering together, it's spirit in nature, not even physical in nature. There was a gathering together of focused spirits moving in corporate agendas together to accomplish atmospheres that can be released even in your home. I believe that the corporate anointing is going to move in a tangible way in your home and we're going to talk about the way that that is accomplished today. One of the first principles before I move into our scripture that I want my note takers to write down is that pray, our worship is attached to the subject of surrender. Surrender. Worship is attached to the subject of surrender because surrender is the nature of worship. Write that down. Surrender is the nature of worship. Uh, surrender uh, in generalized war tactic seems like a point of ending. It, it, it's, it's a stopping point. But in a kingdom mentality, surrender is a strategy. Surrender in the kingdom is not the end. It is the new beginning. So I want to move in a discussion like that today. If you've got your Bible, let's run to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm going to read, and y'all know I'm a, generally a New King James guy, but I'm going to hit it from the New Living Translation today. Genesis chapter 22, and I'm going to start at verse 3. It says, the next morning, Abraham got up early, saddled his donkey, and took two of his servants with him, along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the two servants. The boy and I will travel a little further and we will worship there and then we will come back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. Isaac said, we have fire and we have wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering. Lord bless the reading of your word and everybody said amen. If you would, I'm not generally a title guy, but I'm going to do this today because it's directional. I want you to type in worship until it hurts. Type that in. Worship until it hurts. So just holler at your neighbor through a comment and say worship until it hurts. Um, I'm going to start like this. I am a lover of the church. I'm a lover of all things church. I'm a church boy. And so there are some people who just don't like the church. But for me, even when I was running from the church, I love church culture. I, I always had respect for the church. When I was away, uh, uh, even in times of rebellion, uh, I'd cuss you clean out in pu public, but I would never cuss in church. When it came to church, I would tell people cuss it. Don't do that in here. And then go right back to cussing at lunch. But because there was always a respect for the house of God. There are some things that I believe could be improved in the house of God, particularly the inhabitants. You'll get it later. But, but also the teachings, because the church puts so much focus, and this is why 2020 threw us off. We put so much focus on getting them to come that we didn't spend time discipling them in what to do now that you're here. And so we had buildings full of people who had no idea 
idea what to do outside of attendance. And so now they just began to regurgitate the old lifestyle that they had out there in here. Tried to do the same thing and just sanitize it a little bit for the surroundings. And now the discussion became not what can I do for God, but how much can I get away with and still be cool? And so we had to realize that there are people in church who don't know or understand what they're looking at when we gather. And so it could be confusing if you come from a club background because the club had music too. The club had beats too. And people would move to the music in the club. And the music had phrases and cliches that, that, that were catchy. And so if you came from the club to the church and that then you found the church had a little bump in its music and you could easily begin to think that this is the same thing as that. And before long, you're in the culture of it and you're swaying with this music now. You're moving with this music now. And the error is that these things are not the same at all. And though we use terms like worship service, like log in on Sunday night and tune in to our worship service, everybody doesn't know what a worship service is. Even some of you I would submit that have been in church for years now because if you've been in a while, you're expected to know even if you weren't taught. And some of you have received vague understanding and are intimidated that, that, that I don't really know what it means and you grow up now and you teach what you don't know. You, you regurgitate bad definitions that were given to you by bad teachings and bad information. And so now now, some of us are leading with bad information because we were never given authentic basics. And so it is, I believe, with the term of worship. Millions of people are either attending or logging on right now on this Sunday and are going to these encounters and enjoying worship services. And many of them are not going to be worshiping at all. That is not to even say that I exclude some of us from this conversation because I don't think that at all. I am concerned that a large portion of the body of Christ, particularly the American church, has no idea what worship really is. And so I want you to have a good working definition of what worship is for you. Worship is not dressing up nice because some of y'all ain't got out of your pajamas on Sunday in not nine months. Worship is not attending a service. Worship is not being entertained in a religious connotation. It's not that. Worship, in fact, is not just the singing of a song. It's not the reading of a scripture, not just the bowing of a head. It, it, it's not just dancing or however we express our worship. It is more than that. Worship is expressed outwardly in many different facets, but it is not based on external issues at all. It is a matter of the heart. Now we understand that that heart in a biblical and theological context is not your blood pumper, it is your spirit. It is an issue of the spirit. It is the deepest part of you reaching out to the deepest part of God. And it is challenging there because there is nothing else in life that asks us for the things that worship asks us for. When you worship, it requires that you worship from and up of and in your spirit. Now, when you get married, you, you don't marry them from your spirit. Marriage is a fleshly covenant. It cuts through the flesh. It, it's consummated in the flesh. Marriage is of this world. And when you get a job, nobody hires you for your spirit. You don't believe me? Stay home a whole week and say you're there in spirit. First of all, that's witchcraft. Second of all, you're fired. So they hire you for what you think. They hire you for your intellect. They hire you for your soul and they hire you for what your body can do. It is the soul and the body realm, but never the spirit realm. So you don't get opportunities at large in a workplace or you're not hired for the engagement of your spirit. You didn't get a degree because you were spiritual. You just, you telling me you walked in the room and spoke in tongues and they signed your degree. No. So you've probably not had to use your spirit for many things in your 
your natural life. And most of us have attended church for weeks and months and years. And though we are glad to see you be a part of our gatherings, many of us have spent the entirety of our church journey dragging our body in like corpses to sit down for a few hours and then drag our body back home. We never engage our spirit when we're there. And for many of us, I'm not sure that we've had a worship experience, a real worship experience. I don't mean going to buildings that have worship on the side. Have you ever had a real encounter that was so thirst quenching and mind renewing and heart transforming and, and over an overshadowing of the power of the Holy Spirit that it put you into a realm that made you change and you went back home and sunk in your chair because of how overwhelmed you were about what you just encountered. And me, I got to be honest, being of a Pentecostal persuasion, we have a tendency to become flamboyant in our physical expression. We have the rhythm, we have the noise, we have the movement, but the movement, hear me here, the movement of the body does not necessarily equate to the movement of your heart. There are many hands that are lifting today that don't have the hearts to match it. In fact, in the book of Joel, God said, rend your hearts unto me, not your garments. In other words, I appreciate your dance and I appreciate your shout, your shout. but if it does not come with your heart, I don't care. Would you just type in right now and say he wants your heart? Just holler at somebody with a comment and say he wants your heart. Now, after years of being in all kinds of church, I am convinced that worship experiences are not real ones, are not a commonality. And worship is important. It is extremely important to God. Remember over in John chapter 4, where when Jesus comes down to the well, he leaves his disciples and he waits there on one woman to come to the well because this woman could potentially be a worshiper. He is not waiting on her worship because she is so spiritual. Really, not at all. In fact, she's the opposite at this point. It's not because she's so deep. It's not because she's so consecrated. He, 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 the, this is really, honestly, one of the most dysfunctional women we see in Scripture. Uh, and yet Jesus waits all day for a woman to come to the well, she's been married five times, is currently playing house with a man that is not her husband, and Jesus waits all day. Listen, don't nobody have all day to wait, especially when you understand you've only got three years of ministry. But he's waited all day for one woman, and when she finally shows up, pay attention, he asks her for something. Mm -hmm. He says, I thirst Give me something to drink. Now, it's important to highlight that the whole conversation starts not with what she needs from him, but what he wants from her. He says, give me something to drink. She says, you've got nothing to draw with. She's thinking, oh, here we go. This is just another one of these men trying to get something from me. And so he says, woman, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water. And this whole conversation really begins to get strange now because they're talking about one thing, but at the same time, they're talking about something completely different. They were never really Really talking about water. Jesus didn't need a drink. He said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink. In fact, if you drink of what I would give, you would never be thirsty again. Now, he says, one drink from me and you'll never thirst again. They can't be talking about real water because how many of you have wanted a drink since you got saved? Mm-hmm. So they aren't talking about water, but water is being used metaphorically to discuss and describe a spiritual principle because water is a necessity of the body that the body is largely made of. And if I don't have water, I will die. And water is to the body what worship is to the spirit. Could it be possible that you have been operating on your journey with Christ? dehydrated. 
Even those of you who are well fed, those of you who know the word, those of you who are doctrinally developed, could it be possible that you have doctrine and dehydration because you have not had the water of worship applied to your life to quench the thirsting of your spirit? And although you have more information and although we have more sermon notes than we've ever had, we got more books and study materials than we've ever had, can it be possible that you have learned more about God than you know him? Could it be possible that you know more about him than you actually know him? Because you can regularly attend church services and be thirsty. Y'all, listen, you don't want to talk to me. You can attend church for years and never move out of dehydration. She says the conversation begins to move from water to worship and she catches on. She says, my people worship in the mountain. So here we got a good church woman. I, 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 she, she knows what church she goes to. She, she knows what they believe. She knows their creeds. She knows where they worship. Got five husbands and a sugar daddy, but she knows she's a good church woman. And so she hits Jesus square in the face with her church doctrine. We worship in the mountain. Jesus says, you worship in the mountain. We worship in Jerusalem. But a time is coming that they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father, catch the word, seeketh such to worship him. In other words, if you stay on the mountain and we stay in Jerusalem, we are both going to miss a worship experience because the power of God is not in the place and the power of God is not in the region. It is in the realm, the spirit realm. And then he says, God is a spirit. In other words, He's made of what he wants from you. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Somebody just shout, I hear you. Come on, type it in and say, I hear you. So suddenly we recognize that this was never about water. It was always about worship. And you begin to wonder how many of us have been going to the mountain every Sunday, going to Jerusalem every weekend, and leaving completely dehydrated because we never had a spirit experience with God. And, and I'll give you some of the plight of our generation. We are tricked into the idea that we are having spirit experiences when our soul gets tickled. When our soul gets moved, we think we're having spirit experiences and there is a deeper realm. Can it be possible that all we did when we came from the club to the church is exchange one style of dance for another? But, but our spirit is never being quenched and it's still thirsty because we approach God the same way we approached everything else, either through your body or through your mind, but never through your spirit. One of the signs that this woman had a church experience but not a worship experience was that she's had a series of failings in an area of relationship in her life. Maybe the reason that she could not hold on to any of these relationships that she had was because she was trying to get some Something from another source that she could only get in God. Perhaps some of our frustrations with our jobs, with our careers, with our ministries, with our education, with our business, is that we are trying to get something out of the soul or the flesh that can only come in the spirit. And though you're good enough, and though you're nice enough, and though you're kind enough, and though you're respectful enough, and though you honor God enough to be uh, on this live stream every Sunday night, can it be possible? possible that we are coming to a worship experience but have yet to worship God w would you be willing to risk here's where you've got to kill your pride would you be willing to risk the humiliation of admitting that and maybe I've been in church for years and perhaps those of us that are spiritual still don't know what worship is are we praise teaming and song leading and book writing and preaching sermons on worship and still not worshiping so the first time in the Bible that we see worship used in the proper way is in Genesis chapter 22. 
when Abraham is taking his son Isaac up to the mountain, up to the mountain, the son that he waited his entire life for. I need you to catch what I'm saying. Now God is asking Abraham to sacrifice him. Isn't it the least favorite part about God that God always has this knack of wanting your best stuff? I'm going to leave that there. Wanting your best stuff. I mean the thing that you've been waiting your whole life for. And because God doesn't want to give you anything that you will worship more than him. In fact, the word worship comes from two words combined. Worth ship. Worth ship. And when you worship, you are telling the worth of something to you. And God does not desire for you to have anything in your life that is worth more than him to you. So when you give to God something that is worth something to you, you are saying that you are still worth more than the something that I'm giving you. Somebody say worship till it hurts. Worship till it hurts. Worship till it hurts. And people who find Find it difficult to give God things like people in relationships, to give God things like their money and their treasure, to give th God things like their time. They find it difficult because whatever it is, is worth more to me than him. I, I, and that, listen, this is a teaching that can kill your joy right here. That, that's why he said you cannot serve two masters, speaking of God and mammon. Mammon means money. He says you can't love money and love of me on the same plane. And sometimes it is difficult for people to surrender their tithe and surrender their offering because money is worth so much. What is God worth to you? Worship. He says to his servants, me and Isaac are going a little further to worship. The Hebrew word for worship here literally means to prostrate yourself, to humble yourself, to lay flat on the floor. And before you get in your mind that everybody standing ain't worshiping, understand that this is not just a matter of laying down. Perhaps uh, it's not just a matter of, uh, of you getting flat on the floor in the physical sense. Because we could all lay down on the floor and not worship. That, that, that is just a physical expression, hear me, of an inner attitude towards God where you see yourself humble in comparison to him and you fall on your face in humility before him. In fact, in the Old Testament, most of the people who had a real God encounter literally fell on their face before God and didn't get up until God said, get up. Not only in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, when John heard a voice like a trumpet, he fell on his face as though he were dead before God. When Ezekiel saw the wheel in the middle of the wheel and saw the presence of God, he fell flat on his his face and God had to speak to him <laughs> to raise him back up on his feet again because there was something about seeing the magnitude and the worth of God that makes you bow yourself like Isaiah and say, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. Me and Isaac are going further to prostrate ourselves in the presence of God. We will return. Now, I'm not even going to mess with that, but it's interesting to me that he says we will return. There's something there. And so he go here goes Abraham leaving his house, leaving the familiar, because you cannot begin to have a worship experience until you are willing to leave the familiar and to, to leave the ordinary, to leave the mundane, to leave the thing that you relate to is the beginning of you submitting yourself to worship. I'm talking about not you leaving your address. I'm talking about you leaving your comfort zone. Some of you have not tapped into worship experience because your arrogance won't let you leave normal. You've got to stay with people who look like you, act like you, smell like you, do like you, and you are never willing to risk the incubation of your atmosphere to have a real God experience. Well, why? Because often we are built to seek the approval of those around us, and if everybody don't approve of what we do or how we do it, I'm not ready to have a God experience. Lord, I'm preaching. If you don't like this, you might as well scream. 
scroll on to somebody else because it's only going to get worse from here. So Abraham leaves everything that was familiar to him and he begins this journey to worship. Where are you going, Abraham? He says, I'm going to a place. <laughs> now, he can't even describe the place that he's going to. He just knows it's the place to be. That there's something about the place of the presence of God that is hard to encapsulate with description. It's not a particular song that works every time. It's, it's not a way that we shout that works every time. It's not the exact level of my hand raising or my bowed head. It's not anything like that at all. It's something in the spirit. Spirit, and when you get there, you know you're there. Have you ever gone, maybe you've gone shopping, and they ask you what they can help you find, and you say, I don't know, but I'll know it when I see it, right? So, so that's the way that worship is. There is a certain place that you are hungry for, a certain realm your spirit is searching for, a certain dimension you are seeking out, and you can't even really tell anybody what it is, but you'll know it when you see it. And it'll show up in the middle of a song. It'll show up in the middle of a prayer. It'll just, it'll just appear in the middle of praise. And while you're laying in the bed praying, all of a sudden you got a sense that something else is in the room with me. You're driving down I-94 and all of a sudden you just know that something else has dropped in your car. And you can't explain what it is. You just know I'm in the place. Would you just say that? Say, I want to go to the place. Come on, type it in. I want to go to the place. He said, I'm going to the place. And all I know is I'll know it when I get there. Worship is a journey. Worship is a process. And listen, it is the process of going up to a place. Now, highlight that word, going up to a place. I, I, I got to go up to worship. That's why when the queen of Sheba comes and comes to Solomon to see the temple that he has built, the, the thing that took her breath away was not the money because girlfriend went broke. Uh, she was a rich black woman from Ethiopia. She had money before she ever got to Solomon. So it's not her jewelry that is blowing her mind. She didn't come to get anything from him. She was loaded when she arrived. But when she got there and she saw his worship. It said when she saw how they went up, there was no breath left in her because she was in all of their worship. She was in awe of how they came into the presence of God. And she started referencing their attitudes in the moment. How happy are thy men? Worshiping men then are happy men. All the angry, depressed, and stressed out men, your worship is your remedy. And just to throw this in, we have to throw away the lie that worship is based in femininity. Worship is as masculine as as well as it comes. The Bible said there was no breath left in her. The journey of upward worship took her breath away. And so Abraham starts the journey up and the Bible says that he, when he was three days into the journey, he saw the place. Now, let me reference this. Almost everything in Genesis 22 that we read is a symbolic type and shadow of Jesus Christ. The father and the son going to the mountain would later be exemplified to us as Calvary. The father offering up the son. Me and the lad shall return again. A picture of the resurrection. The burnt offering, a type and shadow of the crucifixion. All of it comes as a very symbolic shadow of Christ. I don't have time to teach all that, but I've got to mess with at least the three days. Because when the worship experience came, only after three days. Three Three days. When I see three, Lord, y'all now y'all know my Pentecostal thing. Whenever I see three, I begin to think about how he died and was buried. And on the third day rose again with all power in his hands. And then we beheld the wonder of his glory. Truly the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The third day is when we saw him in his splendor. That's when we began to see him for who he really was. Up until this point, he's been with us. But now he's about 
to be in us. It's all on the third day. And three days into the journey, Abraham lifts up his eyes and sees the place. He sees where I've been pressing for. He, sa he says it right there. That's it. Now, now, wherever he was, I want you to highlight the fact, when he saw it, he wasn't there yet. I see it, but I'm not there yet. I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I'm trying to be. And most church people stop right here. We get close enough to worship to see it, but not close enough to participate with it. We can see it. In fact, for years, y'all been driving in your car a long way to watch other people do it. And the better they do it, the more people will come. In fact, if you can worship real good, you can pack a place out with great singers and dancing and speaking and teaching. People will come and sit for two hours and watch you worship. They'll begin to argue over who puts the best worship show on. That was okay, but if you go over here around the corner, they got it going on. There's a lady over there who takes us somewhere. Uh, but, but excuse me, let me just holler at y'all real quick. It has never been about who was on the stage. Why are you showing up to watch worship? Lord Jesus. Why are you not coming to worship? Me and the boy are going to worship. Not to watch. Who in here ever gets thirsty and goes to watch a glass of water? Y'all, now y'all ain't gonna talk to me. I mean, look at this water bottle. Look at how good this water looks. That water looks like it would quench my thirst. Look at this. This thing would fix what I have a deficit of right now. I wonder how many of us have been driving to church for years now and looking at water. Looking at water and us still being dehydrated. It sounds stupid, but it's what we've been doing. I, I wonder what it is to, to, to wake up and, and, and press in on a Sunday to make sure that you're tuned in every Sunday night to alive and do all that to show up and watch glasses of water. Why watch it when you can drink it? Why watch other people do it when you can experience it? Why be a spectator when God is beckoning you to be a participator? If being a spectator was worth coming to, can you imagine what it would be like to actually grab the bottle and take a drink? Would you just holler at three people with a comment right now and say, please, Take a drink. Please take a drink. Take a drink. <laughs> Me and the boy are going farther to prostrate ourselves in the presence of God. And we will return. We'll be back. But we're not coming back until we worship. I will not go back and leave the moment until I've worshiped. I refuse to go after something and not get it. And to name something and not have it. And profess something and not possess it. If I'm going after it, I'm not coming back until I have it. I, I think we might be getting pushed into worship right here. You, you, you should warn somebody in the comments right now, I might blow up this feed because I am a worshiper. You, 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 you should have an opportunity to go and find a different space in the house right now because I am a worshiper because if you mess around as a worshiper and start participating not in soul and body but in spirit you may get on somebody's nerves you may not be as popular you may have people look down their nose at you but some of us are thirsty enough to not care what anybody thinks about us anymore I'm thirsty enough and in trouble enough to say whatever it takes somebody Give me some water. Would you throw your hands up right there in the house and say, I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. In 2021, I'm going to worship. 2020 did not steal my worship. I want to worship not God. Not because I'm perfect. Not because I'm holy. Not because I've got it all together. But maybe if I prostrate my spirit before him, I wouldn't bow so easily to so many other things. Maybe I would need so much from my relationships if I 
I could get what I needed from God from God. I wouldn't be so thirsty for people if I wasn't dehydrated from a lack of worship. I wouldn't be running for the approval of this one and that one, the acceptance of this. Some of us just flat out need a worship experience. For your own mental health, you need worship. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. For your sanity, you need worship. For your stability, you need worship. Jesus waited at the woman at the well because she needed to worship him. She was a perfect candidate. I'm trying to hurry. She was a perfect candidate for a worship experience. Why? Because she was a desperate woman. Desperation. Desperate people do desperate things. Desperate people make desperate sounds. And when they are truly desperate, they get to the point where they don't care anymore. Worship is a journey. Me and the boy go. Somebody holler go. Type in go. Shout go. We, we go farther to worship. Now, Remy is the queen of questions for me. When we are driving, it is without fail, before we even get out of the space of our neighborhood, she's going to ask, are we there yet and where is it? And I'll say it's a little bit further. It's just a little bit further. That means if you are going to see what you left the house to get to, you are going to have to go further. Me and the boy are going further, which means, pay attention, it is a conscious, intelligent decision. Now, y'all have ascribed real worship experiences to losing control of your body and bucking and jerking. And I, I, I'll quicken with the best of them. And the next thing I knew, I was up. No, that is not worship. Worship is a conscious, intelligent decision. We are going further with intentionality and the purpose of worship. And when we finish, we will be Back now, there were three things that I'm done. Three things that they had to take with them. For anybody that is listening to me right now that wants to go with the purpose of worship, you've got to have three things. Three things. Because everybody can't worship. That Everybody can praise. And we must. But everybody is not worshiping. When you praise God, you praise Him for the things that He has done. And it is a requirement. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything. Which means you don't even have to be human to be a praiser. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Everything praises God. The birds, the rocks, the trees, the lightning, the thunder, the waves on the beach are praising God. The bees buzzing, the leaves blowing in the wind. It's all praising God. The stars in the constellations are telling of the glory of God. They are all praising God. Everything that has breath, the lion running, the rabbit in the rabbit hole, everything that has breath is praising God. Everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything can praise, but everything cannot worship. When we praise God, we praise Him for what He's done. And it is the first step into the temple. It is the entryway and the door, the front door of the protocol of God's presence. Lord, you brought me from a mighty long way. You fed me when I was hungry. You brought me through the storm. I thank you for being there for me. I, I wouldn't even have clothes to wear if it wasn't for you. You blessed me with my car. Thank you for my car. You, I, I know this was you. Didn't even have the credit for it and you made a way. You praise Him about the car. Because the car is a testimony of what God has done. Thank you for shoes and coats and my car and my, my husband and my wife and my children. Thank you. It's all the things God did. You protected me. That is the stuff that gets you in the door. But what puts you in the room is not what got you in the door. Praise puts you in the door, but worship puts you in the room. What is the difference? Worship says, if I didn't have shoes, y'all ain't going to go with me. If I never get married, if I never have a job, if I have to sleep under a bridge, if nobody ever loves me, if I have to walk through life by myself, God, you are still good. I worship you not for what you did. That's praise. I worship you for being God. I worship you for being holy. I worship you for being magnificent, for being matchless, for being who you are. Somebody holler worship. Worship. You're worth so much to me. Just having your presence 
this. Even if you don't do anything, whew, I'm stirring myself. Even if you don't do anything, worship says, thank you for giving me you. Just knowing that I'm not in a season like we're in now by myself. Just knowing that, lo, you are with me always. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I lay down at night knowing that I'm never in the house by myself. And just knowing you are in the house. That's worship. That's worship. That's worship. God, pay attention, sees a praiser, but the Father seeketh a worshiper. Woo! God sees a praiser, but the Father seeketh a worshiper. He seeks for a worshiper. Now that scripture messes with me because I lose stuff all the time. And I'm seeking stuff all the time. But the Father is omniscient, which means that he knows everything. And for God to say that he's looking for something is mind-blowing. Out of all the things that he knows, he is looking for a worshiper. The Father seeketh such. In all the masses of people, why would he say that? Because in all the masses of people that are showing up to his house, showing up to his gatherings, the Father is still having to look in who showed up for who came in spirit. This clearly means that everybody ain't doing it. Woo! The Father seeketh such. I wonder what God would do in the middle of a corporate people if he would look in your home right now and in this place right now and, and in your home over there and, and find real worshipers. I wonder what he would begin to crack open in our lives. Would you just holler at somebody and say, let's go farther to worship. Let's go farther to worship. Uh, what am I doing? I'm trying to get you to realize that you're more thirsty than you think you are. I'm trying to make you anxious for something more than just getting back in the building to a chair. I'm trying to start a flat out riot of all nations south worship and I want a revolution to hit the south suburbs of Chicago and slap it dead in its face. I mean a radical worship movement full of people who don't care what anybody thinks about them, don't care if they like our style, don't care if they like me. People who will come out and authentically and and consistently fall in spirit, prostrate in desperate worship. Look at your neighbor in those comments and say, I wonder what would happen if you would worship. I wonder what would happen in your problems. I wonder what would happen in your needs. I wonder what would happen in your mind. Aren't you just a little bit curious of what would be the fruit of authentic worship? I, I, if, you, if you put uh, all your, your, your degrees in the joy, if you put your arrogance in the jaw, if you put how bright you think you are in the jaw, because the fact is, what you think you know today is going to be ignorance in 10 years. You're not as bright as you think you are in comparison to the God that we serve. If we would curb all that and come in spirit, the deepest part of you coming to him as one who knows nothing and him who knows everything. I wonder what would happen if we would bow our hearts in the presence of God and and lose sight of all that you hold to be fact and truth. If we could get in the presence of God and be awed by the wisdom of heaven, be awed by the precision of heaven, the grace of heaven, the infinite knowledge of heaven. I wonder what would happen if everybody listening to me right now would worship. Let me give you these three things in five minutes. Three things for those who are going to take me up on this dare and consider real worship. You need three things. Abraham, list them for us. Number one, he took the wood. It's all in your Bible. You see it in Moses' tabernacle. You see it in David's tabernacle. You see it in Solomon's temple. You see it in the Ark of the Covenant. You see the wood. What does the wood represent? The wood represents your humanity. If you are going to worship, you have got to bring wood, humanity. But it's not just any type of wood. Pay attention to me. It's dead wood. If you are going to worship God, there must be something in your life that is dead. 
that he's cut off from you, that you are not going to go back to again. There has to be something that has been cut off at the root that I'm not going back to anymore. It's dead. And that thing is the wood for you. You can't worship without a testimony. Your testimony provokes the, uh, the identity of how you know God. There has to be something of experience that comes in your life that where you went through a test and came out with a testimony and it became the wood for your life. The wood. The wood is for the worship. Your humanity is for the worship. You can't have what I've been through and go through what I've been through and not have a perspective of God to come from. Does anybody have your humanity to offer him? Number two, you need the, the, the wood, the humanity. Number two, you've got to have some fire. Woo! Now you know, listen. Fire, the same thing that showed up on the day of Pentecost. When you start talking about having fire, you are talking about you've got to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. You've got to have some spirit. You've got to have a fresh in filling of the Holy Spirit. I think that is a point of emphasis at the top of this year because whenever God started a new thing in Genesis, he breathed into man. His first thing was to breathe. The first thing you need to do in a new season is look for a fresh breath. The Holy Ghost is just like fire. Fire generates heat and generates light. And people don't know how you are so comfortable in all the trouble around you, but it's because I've got the Holy Spirit giving me climate control. Have you ever been able to go through a dark place and all of a sudden God's presence just shows up, to just lit things up, and all of a sudden you said, I know what to do, and I had no idea before. You had fire in your hand. Whenever fire burns, it changes molecular structures. It rearranges molecules. Whenever the Holy Spirit touches anything, it is going to change what it touched. Lord Jesus. So number one, I need the wood. I need the humanity. Number two, I need the fire. Would you holler at somebody and say, I want the fire. I want the fire, which means I need to show up on fire. I need to come to these corporate gatherings on Sunday nights, bringing fire with me, not seeking to be reignited. Number three, Lord, may the smoke rise in all nations south. We got the wood, the humanity. We got the fire, the Holy Spirit. The worship will get in your life and heal areas that have been hurt. But number three, you got the humanity. You got the fire. Number three, the thing, the last thing you must carry as a worshiper is the knife. The knife. Oh, hey is what he carried for the things that were not dead yet. I need you to lean in here, right here with me. He went up on the mountain with some things that were dead. But he also went up on the mountain with some other things that still had to die. And he said, I'm not going to kill Isaac now. But when I get in the presence of God, listen to me. There are some things that you cannot slay until you get in the presence of God. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. There are some things that can't die until I'm in the presence of God. You don't have the strength to get out of it until you get into it. And when you get into the presence of God, you can break strongholds that you have tied yourself to, struggles in your life, generational curses. Just start worshiping and get in the presence of God and then begin to pull your knife on those things in those moments. Now that I got you in the anointing, I am going to take you out. There is an anointing that can destroy the yoke. It can be destroyed, but for it to be destroyed, destroyed, we've got to be willing to go a little bit further. We've got to be willing to move up higher and pull our knife in the high place so that we can kill every limitation and everything that is stopping us from being what God has desired us to be. Thus, the title of this today is Worship Until It Hurts. Worship until you find yourself in the place where you can take out what you couldn't take out on your own. For, for the place where you can pull your knife on the things that are not yet dead. The place where I can find the fire of his glory and his power. And the place where I have the wood, my testimony. Then regardless of what it looks like for you, if you do it from your spirit and do it from your heart, guess what? You will find yourself in an authentic worship 
experience. Somewhere in the journey of a worship experience where, where the wicked, you find yourself in a place where the wicked cease from troubling, in a place where he lifts your burden and you won't even know where it went or where it disappeared to. In that place, it's the place of exchange where he gives you beauty for ashes, where he gives you joy for sorrow, where he gives you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. In that place, the things you came worrying about are left in his hands now. In that place, the anxiety of unresolved issues and the fear of what's not going right, you lose that stress and begin to come out with a de declaration of if God is for us, that he is more than the world against us. But you never find yourself there if you don't commit to an authentic worship experience. I refuse to sit and watch you die spiritually in a year like 2020 we just went through while you are sitting right next to a fountain of living water. I'm imploring you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you for your own sake as your pastor, as your leader, that you would prioritize the posture of authentic worship. That you would allow yourself to be challenged, not by the moving of your feelings, but challenge yourself with intentionality that when we gather on these Sunday nights over the course of this year, that you would apply yourself to the, to the atmosphere of a corporate anointing. That, what the, the, that spirits are not bound to space and time, but that what we do in these moments together would shift what we're coming back to, would shift the realm of the South Sub as we come back to that we don't come back and have to start over on the spiritual groundwork but that the atmosphere of worship will continue as we flow forward lift your hands right where you are I pray and declare over you that God would give you an unction right now, a stirring in your belly right now to open up yourself to fresh, authentic worship. That you would allow the corporate anointing when we gather to change your heart and change your mind and change your life. And that God would offer you new realms and dimensions of his glory as we move through and navigate this season together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on and clap your hands right there where you are. God bless you. I love you all nation south. Let's go to worship.